last rough cut of the semester, so thanks for participating. It's not the last, it's the second to the last, because next week uh, is a big event here on campus. Um, it's the Montana State University Extension Climate Science Conference, and IOE is co-sponsoring this. Uh, and we're going to have, there's two speakers coming next week that are giving evening talks. Um, one is Bob Inglis, who is a former U.S. representative from South Carolina, Republican, uh, spoke out supporting the science for climate change and was not uh, reelected, was not uh, selected for the Republicans uh, and the Tea Party guy won. So he's talking uh, next. Uh, Tuesday evening on how free enterprise solutions can solve climate change. I think he's a really interesting guy. And then the other speaker that we're hosting is Michael Mann from Penn State, and he is giving uh, next Wednesday's rough cut. He's talking at 12:15, and it'll be over in the sub as part of this extension conference. Uh, Michael Mann is uh, the scientist who led the development of the hockey stick curve of climate change, you know, the last thousand years, how it shows the increase in temperatures globally uh, in the last century, and then was subjected to all kinds of uh, abuse. So it's about climate, the front lines of climate change and all of the politics around that. So he's talking next Wednesday and also Wednesday evening. And uh, I encourage you to go online to the Climate Science Conference website and see what looks interesting to you there. It looks like it should be a really good meeting. Okay, that's next week. But this week, <laughs> we have Dr. Molly Cross, and I'm just really pleased that she's here. Uh, she and I were probably the, one of the two first people to meet each other when we both moved to Bozeman about 10 years ago, and it's been great to watch Molly's career just grow and develop. She is the Climate Change Adaptation Coordinator for the North American Program of the Wildlife Conservation Society. And in that job, she's really leading several climate uh, change planning efforts, both within the state and across the country. Um, she's really good at involving diverse stakeholder groups uh, in these conversations at several levels to look at issues of biodiversity and, and really what climate change means for, for different uh, parts of the landscape and, and different groups. She's a co-editor of a book called Climate and Conservation, Landscape and Seascape Science. Um, she got her PhD at Berkeley working on climate change in high altitude plant communities. So thanks, Molly, for coming. Thanks, Kathy, so much for, that invita for the invitation to come and speak and everybody for coming. Um, so as Kathy mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about the work that I've done on planning for the effects of climate change. And over most of my career, I've been primarily focused on planning for natural systems. So natural resource managers, wildlife conservation, focused on those issues. And recently, I've been starting to think a little bit more about this kind, these kinds of issues at the interface, so thinking about human and natural systems. So uh, this is sort of a first attempt to sort of start to talk about some of those issues. It's something I'm trying to do more and more work in. Um, but I am going to talk just a little bit about some of our efforts to look at adaptation strategies that can benefit both natural and human systems here in Montana. And then another topic I'm going to touch on throughout the presentation, which is not explicitly part of the title, but I hope would, will be relevant to folks working with the Institute on Ecosystems, and in particular, those of you who may be involved in the Montana Climate Assessment, is thinking about how adaptation planning efforts can be a really useful uh, way to better understand end user information needs about climate change. What kinds of science and information could be really helpful in making natural resource management decisions, but also other kinds of decisions? So I'm going to touch on that. I know that with the Montana Climate Assessment, there's a really strong push for not just sort of synthesizing information that's going to sit on the shelf, but really to generate information that can plug into decision making. And, and it's not always easy knowing what that information is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've tried to use the planning efforts that I've been involved in to try to uncover some of those more um, detailed information needs. So throughout the talk, I'm going to sort of start by introducing the Wildlife Conservation Society um, and a little bit about my role there. 
Um, but I'm going to primarily talk about the approach that we take to doing climate change planning. Again, touching on how we try to use that approach to not only advance people taking action on adaptation, but also thinking about information needs. I'm going to provide a sort of case study or sort of some examples of some of the on-the-ground work where we're trying to move beyond the planning to actually taking actions on the ground that are, again, intended to benefit both human and natural systems in Montana. And then I'll wrap up with just a couple of really quick teasers on some other related work and um, talk a little bit about how, maybe just share a couple of my perspectives on how I think some of the work I've done or, or some of the techniques we use might be um, useful to the Montana Climate Assessment. So I thought it would be worthwhile just to say a couple of words about the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, how many people here have heard of WCS before? And how many of you heard of WCS before seeing my talk advertised or meeting me? OK, fewer hands, <laughs> but still a few. Um, and I don't mean to put anybody on the spot. And in fact, that's exactly what I expected. And I had never heard of WCS until about a year before I started working there, probably partly because I was, you know, my background is in plant ecology, ecosystem ecology. I had never worked on wildlife before. Um, and so I was unfamiliar with a lot of the big names in wildlife research and wildlife conservation um, until well after starting at WCS when I would embarrassingly say things like, who's George Schaller or, um, you know, who's Hornocker? You know, so there's sort of these, these big names in wildlife conservation that I've never heard of until I worked at WCS. Now, some of you who know WCS might also know that it was originally the New York Zoological Society. We started, and actually we were chartered very early in uh, 1895 is when the organization was created. We started up the Bronx Zoo, and to this day, we still run all the zoos and aquariums in New York City. And uh, that was definitely news to me. You know, as I started to learn about some of the field conservation work that WC WCS does, I thought it was very strange that I worked for an organization that runs a couple of zoos. But it, it's pretty interesting, and it certainly gives us um, some interesting aspects of our work on sort of veterinary aspects of, of work on wildlife conservation in the field, but also in the zoos. But in addition to starting up the Bronx Zoo, early on in our history, we were also sending naturalists out to obscure parts of the world to you know, discover, uh, catalog, and learn about new species in places where um, at least white human beings were not um, spending a lot of time yet. And that has really grown into a global field conservation program, which is now of equal size to our um, zoo program. And it may be a little hard to see, but you can see some hatched areas. We now work in over 60 countries around the world and around the globe on wildlife conservation issues. Uh, we, we are not quite as good at marketing and branding as the panda bear is with WWF. And so, and, and then, and, and so that's partly why we're not as, well, as big of a name or well known. Um, but we also um, sometimes try to work a little bit under the radar. We do a lot of really close collaborations with agencies. And sometimes it's to our advantage to not necessarily be sort of the, the big panda bear in the room. So sort of how do we approach our conservation work? Our primary approach is about conducting and synthesizing science to inform conservation and management. And so again, it goes way back to our origins. Um, that's William Beebe, who is a, a, a famous um, wildlife naturalist um, who started up an international, I mean, sorry, a tropical research station in Trinidad. Um, and then a few other photos of some of the colleagues I've had the real pleasure of working with um, over the years that I've been at WCS. And so we do a lot of primary research on wildlife and on ecosystems um, in the places where we work across the globe. Um, and then we also do work, again, to synthesize science to try to help sort of bring that science into conservation decision making. Now, in other parts of the world, we actually have helped to set up and set the boundaries for national parks. We actually do the enforcement of a lot of parks in countries, especially where they don't have functioning governments. Obviously, our role here in the US is a little different. We work in close, close partnership with state and federal agencies, primarily also other conservation organizations, and to some degree, private landowners, to help them um, sort of bring science to sort of fill particular areas of expertise and capacity that they may be missing, um, and do research that can help inform their decisions. We target our work on a sort of set number of sort of priority species, wildlife species. We work in a, a handful of priority landscapes. And, um, and the work that I do is we also engage on what we call some cross-cutting issues. And climate change is one of those. 
where it's an issue that is relevant to a lot of different species we work on, a lot of different land, in a lot of different landscapes where we work. And so I am the coordinator of WCS's North America Climate Change Program. Now before I describe a little bit more about our climate change program, anytime I talk about climate change, I always try to start off with some even small little tidbits of what might be some good signs on the climate change front. And um, you know, with this audience, you guys are, are obviously pretty well informed about climate change. You know the world leaders are meeting today and this week in Paris to try and hammer out a deal. And, you know, I think people are really taking that seriously. It'll be really interesting to see what they come out of it. Um, I imagine a lot of you are also pretty familiar or have heard about the Pope's encyclical on climate change, which, which is maybe an even bigger, could, could be an even bigger sort of sea change, and, and uh, if any of you got to see um, Steve Running speak recently, he, he sort of talks about a couple of big things, the Pope's encyclical on climate change, you know, China changing some of their tone about how they talk about their willingness to engage in emissions control. Um, but this is, you know, really, I think, important because having such an influential world leader talk about the importance of climate change is really key. And in terms of how it impacts my job, it lets me spend a lot less of my time having, you know, convincing people that climate change is a problem, and, and then we can engage a lot more in figuring out what are we going to do about it. Uh, obviously, what are we going to do about the root cause? But um, what I work on more specifically is what are we going to do to prepare for and cope with the impacts? And so it allows us to kind of move a little bit beyond. And, and obviously, you know, there's some folks in Congress that aren't there yet and, and a lot of the public who aren't there yet. But a lot of the natural resource managers and conservation practitioners I work with are, you know, get that it's a problem and it's something they should care about. They just don't really know what to do about it or how to wrap their heads around it. And so that's a lot of what I focus my work on, is trying to help people move beyond, you know, because quite honestly, thinking about climate change can be really depressing and, you know, sort of a lot of bad news. And to try to help people kind of get beyond that to sort of take a more problem-solving mentality and give them some tools to be able to do that. And so within our climate change program in North America, we invest in understanding the consequences of climate change to wildlife and, and ecosystems and the landscapes where we work. Those are those sort of yellowish, greenish um, polygons on that map. We engage in a lot of planning to try and think about how do we bring that information on climate change into decision making. And then we work together with partners to implement priority actions that come out of that planning. Um, in addition to getting involved in some implementation in those landscapes where WCS works, we also run a grant program and we invest over $2 million a year of Doris Duke Charitable Foundation's funding into on-the-ground implementation of climate change adaptation actions on the ground. So one of the tools that I've been focused on, I engage most in the planning, as I mentioned at the beginning. And one of the tools that we've helped develop to try to help people get started in thinking about climate change, something we call the Adaptation for Conservation Targets, or ACT framework. And this is a participatory and iterative process for developing place-based adaptation strategies. One of the reasons why I highlighted those words in red is they're kind of like jargony terms. So I want to say a little bit more about what, what I mean by each of them. In terms of um, being participatory, the ACT framework is designed to directly engage both scientists and managers in the planning process together to really try to create that two-way street of information exchange. And so you know, rather than the scientists just sort of giving a presentation and saying, here's what might happen to your species or landscape, and then the managers separately interpreting that information and digesting it into their decisions, we really encourage the scientists and managers to work hand in hand throughout the whole process of planning. And again, I think it allows us to have that sort of best available scientific information at our fingertips as we're doing planning, but it's also an opportunity for scientists to better understand the kinds of decisions and the kinds of, of challenges, decision-making challenges that are being faced by managers on the other end, so that hopefully that information can feed into further research that um, the scientists might want to engage in. We also really emphasize the importance of, of approaching it in a sort of iterative kind of, kind of context. And if you can't read this, but it sort of says develop a plan, implement the plan, evaluate the plan, and make changes. And so we could have, it's that kind of adaptive management type cycle where we acknowledge that we're not going to just plan for climate change, we're going to know the right answer, we'll go forth and implement, you know, we're done. Um, in part because there's uncertainty about what the future might bring. And so one way to deal with that uncertainty is to kind of continually be, be observing how the climate is changing, how it's impacting things we care about, and how to bring, think about how to bring that information into our decisions. 
Um, but I think it also plays a role in trying to use these kinds of planning processes as a way of extracting sort of information needs from the end user community. And a lot of times we encourage people to get started in doing some adaptation planning, even if it's relatively rapid, even if it's relatively qualitative, um, to kind of get started thinking through the full process of what kinds of decisions you might need to make in the face of climate change, because it can really um, uncover some of those key, key points along which, or um, key decision points where additional information can make a big difference in how you, how you invest your resources in conservation going forward. So a lot of times we'll sort of get people just started in doing the planning, recognizing that we might need to go back and collect some more quantitative information to feed into that process sort of in the, as we go through the iterations. And then lastly, when I sort of describe, say that we're intending, trying to, to develop place-based adaptation strategies, it's basically getting at the what to do. What kinds of management and conservation actions do we need to consider taking in order to achieve conservation goals in light of climate change? So, um, you know, and trying to kind of drill down to real specifics uh, in terms of sort of specific actions to take to benefit really specific species or ecosystems that we may be focused on managing for. So in terms of what the steps look like within the ACT framework, um, this is just sort of the, the four main planning steps in the process. And I'm not going to go into really great detail about each step. I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the key features. Um, but, but one of the key features is that it's a stepwise planning process. Again, when we got started with developing this, this sort of framework about eight or nine years ago, a lot of managers were saying, well, we just don't even know where to begin. Like, how, where do I start? What do I do? And so it is intentionally sort of trying to give them some steps they can start to move through in their thought process. Um, and again, it is starts by being real specific about what you're planning for. So you're a manager for grizzly bears or wolverines, or you're a water manager, or maybe you manage a park. I mean, we, we sort of encourage people not to say, well, I'm going to try to plan for everything that's in my park all at once, but to pick some real specific targets. And those could be things that, again, are just sort of your primary management concern today. Whether you know anything about it, it's a, you know, the likely effects of climate change or not, you might just say, well, I manage grizzly bears, so I want to know whether this is a relevant issue for me. Um, or you might say, well, I suspect that wolverines are pretty vulnerable to climate change, so I'd like to really think through what we could do about that. It doesn't really matter, but we really encourage people to be a little bit more sort of drilling down to specifics um, as best as possible. And then there's sort of the whole step of assessing climate change effects. And that's probably a step at which you know, folks like yourselves and a lot of scientists would probably be most interested in exactly how this plays out. I'm going to um, expand on this in another slide in, in a minute. But um, again, this is sort of the step of the planning process that's the most different from regular conservation planning. It's the step that doesn't exist in sort of general conservation planning. It's the piece that really is about climate change and what it might mean for achieving your goals for the target feature. And then, of course, we're really trying to push people beyond that. Because a lot of people, especially when we got started doing this work, had attended a number of different workshops where, or, or presentations about the potential impacts of climate change. And they really wanted to get beyond it. So what do we do about it question. And so the, the last couple steps in the planning process are about um, the first is kind of just a broad brainstorming. What possible actions might you consider taking to achieve your goal as climate changes? And to put lots of ideas out there on the table, recognizing that they may not all be feasible, they may not all be desirable to all players involved, but putting lots of ideas out on the table so that then you can go through some filtering steps to prioritize actions for implementation. So I see kind of two main goals that we really have with these kinds of discussions. One is to actually see if there are actions that we feel really confident enough sort of moving into the taking action phase of the process. So taking action, monitoring the effectiveness of those actions, et cetera. But again, all along the way, we're likely to identify information gaps, information needs that, that might be necessary to fill before other actions, we feel comfortable taking other actions. And so, you know, we can kind of identify those information needs all throughout this process of planning so that we can then try to fill those information needs and feed it back into the planning process in future iterations or to make more targeted decisions about those actions that you didn't feel confident sort of moving right into implementation right away. So again, this is just trying to highlight sort of the ways that I think moving through a planning process like this not only leads to some actions being moved forward on the ground, but also thinking about what kind of additional information do we need to make different or more informed decisions. Well, what time yeah. frame 
the process that yeah. takes place. So um, uh, I'll, I'll go. I'll get into that in a minute. And we've done it on different time frames. I mean, a lot of, a lot of times we'll do um, we'll do two day. We'll do oh, no, I mean like, uh, oh. I mean, how long are you looking at? Oh, how far into the future? It varies. Depends on depends on it depends on the effort, you know, and, and the group and what they're interested in doing. You know, a lot of times, you know, as as you as you probably know, a lot of sort of decision making time frames are, you know, this year, next year, next five years, maybe ten years. Um, what we what we try to do with 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 these planning efforts is Encourage them to look ahead to the climate impacts over maybe the next 50 years, 30 to 50 years. Recognizing, though, that they're still trying to make decisions about the next five to 10 years, maybe, but to kind of be picking their head up and looking at, well, what might be coming down the road? Um, we don't often look ahead like 100 years and kind of go all the way to the end of the next century, but it depends of the century, but it depends on the effort. Yeah. Um, so there's a number of places, uh, geographies in the U.S. and some in Canada, a number of different kinds of targets that we've applied to this framework to doing some initial planning on. And I'm not going to go into detail about any of those, but um, certainly if there's a geography or a sort of species or topic that's of particular interest to you, I can share some of the results from those planning efforts afterwards. But I wanted to say a little bit more about um, kind of how the process unfolds. and, and and to acknowledge right up front that to date, most of the, uh, the step of sort of assessing climate impacts that we've been engaged in uh, has been a relatively qualitative exploratory process. And we do that using things like conceptual models. And so the intent is not for you to read sort of all the details on this diagram, but we use these kinds of box and arrow flow diagrams during our workshop. So this green box, this is the target. This was lowland boreal wetlands in the Adirondacks of upstate New York. And this red box are some of the climate variables that, um, that the group involved thought would be either directly relevant to influencing those low and boreal wetlands or could indirectly influence through hydrology, through um, changes in the shrub and forest um, dynamics, changes in fire, um, changes in, in other aspects of flooding, winter flooding, for example. Um, so, so we use these conceptual models to do a couple things. One is when you have a whole big group of people kind of doing this planning, everybody probably has little models like these in their minds, and mine might not look the same as Wyatt's does. And so part of it is to kind of make it transparent sort of how we think this system is functioning and what we think some of the key linkages are. Um, the other way we use these is, is again, to, to um, look at sort of where does climate fit in to this picture of other kinds of influences on the target we care about. Um, we also use them to talk about assessing the impacts of climate change by saying, you know, let's take, and, and we often look at multiple plausible scenarios of climate in the future, but let's say take a scenario of how seasonal temperature and seasonal precipitation and the water balance might change. And we use it to sort of talk through how we think it will influence hydrology and influence the boreal wetlands, et cetera. So we sort of use these conceptual models quite a bit in our, in our um, conversation. Now, again, part of, and, and we do this a lot during workshop discussions um, with, again, both scientists and manager, manager experts in the room. Uh, we have dabbled just recently in a little bit of more formal expert elicitation, but I haven't done a lot of that, and it's something I would like to explore more, because when you have a big workshop of people um, engaged in a discussion, you know, there's definitely dynamics. You have sort of the very vocal, dominant sort of voices in the room, which can, can influence where, how the conversation goes. Um, but, um, but anyway, that we've generally found them to be pretty productive discussions um, about impacts, although albeit relatively qualitative explorations of those impacts. Um, and, and I'll sort of both, both say, you know, I think that's a little bit of a concern on my end to some degree. You know, I worry that they're a little qualitative and that some of the nuances in the quantitative aspects are really important <laughs> to knowing what the net impact might be on, say, boreal wetlands. But I also realize that you know, we don't have any models that fully capture all of these variables. And yet, a lot of that complexity is going to be really important to understanding the impacts of climate change on these boreal wetlands. And so, at some level, I think we have to also accept that there, that there probably will inevitably need to be a mixture of model-based and quantitative information, empirical information, as well as some level of expert opinion on some of this. because. We do want to consider a lot of those drivers, even though we may not have models or empirical information that can incorporate them all. So, um, you know, again, I think that, that to date, a lot of our discussions have been especially on the qualitative end, 
And that's where um, we really try to see, well, what, what, you know, as we go through this conversation, we start to, as we talk about management decisions, say, well, you know, some of, only some of these things are, are, are factors we can influence through management decisions. And so maybe some of those are the ones we should focus most on in terms of investing in additional research or gathering existing um, you know, information that might already be out there. We just didn't have it in the room at the time we did the planning. Kathy? So does that model come out of a workshop, or is that what you go into a workshop with? Yeah, so good question. We, um, a little bit of each, we usually uh, gather a small group of people to draft a straw man conceptual model in advance of these workshops, which usually are about two to two and a half days long. And then, um, but then we work on it together as a larger group as well and add to it. How radically does it get adjusted? Not usually very much, actually. Yeah. And, and again, there's other levels of, like, of sort of quantitativeness you could bring into this. Right now, all the boxes and arrows are the same sort of size and weight. Um, but they're probably not in people's minds in terms of, or, you know, and, and people may, may, may have different opinions on the relative weight of these things. But, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways. And if we got into that kind of conversation in these workshops, I think you would start to see a little bit more, you know, differences of opinions, perhaps, perhaps on the relative weights. And we don't usually go to that level of discussion in these workshops. So what comes out of these workshops? Um, again, the intent is not for you to read any of these words, but to see, oh, gosh, there's a lot of strategies and a lot of tactics um, for adaptation that come out of these kinds of workshops. What I would generally describe as menus of options, um, in part because a lot of the workshops we've held to date are intentionally bringing different jurisdictions together to plan and talk about um, the impact of climate change. They're not usually at a place where they're ready to agree to agree and make decisions together. So we usually end up getting more like, well, here's a bunch of things to consider. We haven't necessarily filtered them to say, well, what three things are we going to work on together to implement? The, the, the workshops have not always been designed to do that yet. Um, but it does really try to put a lot of ideas out there on the table and to help people link specific actions on the ground in their minds to how it might help ameliorate climate change impacts or help them achieve their goals in light of climate change. Um, and then again, I think the primary output we've seen coming out of these workshops are also information on science and data and research needs. And so I just wanted to dip really quickly into one example of a workshop that we held um, about two years ago now, focused on cold water ecosystems. And um, that included native fish, but it also included other species that like cold water systems and and just more thinking about the aquatic systems themselves and, and the sort of terrestrial and aquatic interface. And so, you know, we, we at this workshop, this list of, of strategies actually came largely out of that workshop. But the other thing that came out of that workshop was sort of this sort of reoccurring theme of what we really need to know is where the cold water is going to be in the future. Where's the water going to stay cold enough? Where might it actually be too cold now, but become more suitable for some of the cold water species we're, we care about in this planning effort. And, and so, you know, this came up time and time again where we would say, well, here's an adaptation strategy in action, but, but it's not just an action we should take anywhere. We should take that action in the cold water refugia, in the places we'll, you know, we'll, that will stay cold. And so it became really clear that this was a really high priority science need to help drive some of the on the ground implementation going forward. And as it turns out, there are actually a bunch of people that are working on this and already were. And they didn't have the data ready at the time of our workshop, but it was kind of came out within a year and a half later. And so, you know, kind of next steps from this workshop have been to try to help create some additional tools to help say, okay, so here's a map of cold water refugia for the Northern Rockies. How do you kind of then use that information to help you decide when and where to take some of these adaptation actions? And so that's kind of how that project is evolving from the relatively qualitative discussion at the start to trying to bring in some more quantitative information in the next go around. So just a key take home message from this part of the process is that I would suggest that adaptation planning with scientists and managers, even some of these more rapid qualitative exploratory discussions can help you identify specific adaptation strategies and actions can identify some targeted information needs, and can actually start to advance actual implementation on the ground. And I maybe haven't sort of articulated that quite yet, but I think the next example is going to give you some, some well, give you an example of 
how we've sort of stepped off from some of this planning to get some actions going on the ground. So in this next part, I'm going to talk about some of the work we've done um, looking at adaptation at the interface of human and natural systems. Now, I fully acknowledge that this work has evolved not as a integrated from the start kind of effort, where I was integrating our thinking about human and natural systems right from the start. Um, and when I talk about some future work, we're trying to do more of that right up front. But what this was is over the last eight or nine, eight, eight years, um, I've been engaged in, and helped to lead a number of different planning efforts related to grizzly bear management and climate change, um, the cold water ecosystem and watershed functioning work I just mentioned. And then I've just recently dabbled a little bit in thinking about the impacts of climate change for ranching li on ranching livelihoods. And, um, and so, so I kind of have been doing these sort of separate planning efforts and, and more and more over time realizing that, for one, if we just plan for the effects of climate change on wildlife, um, we're probably not going to win that battle because unless we can talk about our work in the context of how it also benefits human communities. And so I was kind of recognizing that and then also had an opportunity to do some, um, have some conversations with a local rancher about climate change. And so while these two efforts on grizzly bears and the cold water ecosystems involved many different players from state, federal agencies, from conservation NGOs, um, this planning on the ranching livelihoods just results from really one one-on-one -on -one interaction I've had with one individual rancher. So again, just kind of dipping my toes into that arena, but it's been a really, really amazing experience because he is such a, a fun person to work with um, to really start to think about these issues from a very different perspective than how I've been thinking about it before. So as, as I stepped back from having done these sort of separate and independent adaptation planning efforts, what I realize is there are some common themes coming up across all of them. In terms of common impacts, the impacts on hydrology and water availability stood out as a big concern in all three systems. And so this is an oversimplification of just trying to capture you know, some of the, the dominant um, trends or projected impacts of changes in air temperature and, and some uncertainty in what's going to happen with precipitation. Um, but you know, sort of the end story for the systems we cared about you know, decreased summer-based flows, increased stream water temperatures, uh, decreases in maybe the availability of surface water and, and of wet wetlands, and decreases in soil moisture, generally led to negative impacts on grizzly bears in terms of their dependence on riparian areas for corridors move and movements, um, on, on the hydrological issues and, and aquatic species, and on ranching livelihoods in terms of there being less water available for his ranching operations. So that was sort of some impacts that were shared across the system. And so we could then also look at, well, what were some of the strategies that came up in each of those separate planning efforts to try to deal with some of those hydrological changes? And as I looked across, again, those menus of adaptation options, there were some, some strategies that were coming up consistently across all three. And so again, we can kind of line up all the different strategies that came out of each of these planning efforts and look for, like, what were some of the strategies in action that were recommended on for, you know, that could benefit all three systems. And those included actions that can um, recover or build the natural water storage capacity of ecosystems and watersheds, because that obviously improves hydrological functioning. It helps to replace the diminishing snowpacks that we expect, at, certainly at mid-elevation. But it also serves to improve and help to sustain riparian vegetation in those wildlife corridors. It also helps to sustain ranching operations, which, which in the grand scheme of things for conservation, we actually have a lot of interest in keeping ranches in operation, certainly if they're managed in ways that are compatible with wildlife needs. But um, oftentimes, a ranch like that is going to be a lot better than a broad, rural, exurban sprawl subdivision with roads and, and other sorts of impacts on the system. So these are kind of shared goals and shared outcomes. And so, so then the question was, well, what are some actions that can, can kind of accomplish all these things? And can we get sort of a good coalition of partners lined up to be supportive of the, their implementation because of the multiple benefits they provide? So I want to share just a couple of examples of some specific on-the-ground projects that have stemmed from this kind of thinking. Um, the first is work to implement what we call beaver mimicry structures. Um, there's a number of organizations that have become really interested in trying to um, implement strategies that are mimicking some of the functions that beaver provides. 
So this is my colleague Jeff Burrell on the left. And he's building um, what we, well, we were calling beaver mimic dams, but we've actually moved away from the dam word in part because it triggers a lot of concerns on water, on, on, in terms of water policy and water regulations. Um, and also because they're not really dams. Uh, they're more like, as Jeff called them yesterday when we were talking, speed bumps. These are semi, these are very, really permeable stream-like structures. We, we can go out and build a structure like this in about 10 or 15 minutes. You hammer in the willow stakes. You take long willow branches and you weave them through. And, you know, you, you're, you basically you can almost see it in this picture that the water level here is just a little bit higher than on the other side. And this is Sunny Nathan. She's the um, head of the Madison River Conservation District. So we're working with a lot of local and state and federal partners to do this work. Um, but we've, over the last couple of years, installed over 100 different structures along over 20 miles of streams. We've been trying to target that work in these sort of priority grizzly bear linkage zones because, again, we're trying to look at that, you know, providing multiple benefits, um, not just on the hydrological side, but also for wildlife movements. And we're starting to see some really interesting effects. So this is just a snapshot in time. It's not meant to be sort of proof positive of the effectiveness of these structures. Um, but these are two Google image, images from before Jess installed the beaver mimic structures and after. Um, you know, there's a lot to, to look at in terms of are all other factors sort of being controlled at between these two pictures. But, you know, it's interesting to note that at least the sort of vegetation and level of greenness or lack thereof is not altogether different outside of the riparian areas. But if you can see it, you know, the, the um, structures that Jeff put in have reactivated a side channel that's been dry for a long time. You can see that sort of the vegetation filling in among some of the larger trees and the width of that riparian area is starting to grow, which, is, which are all effects that we are hoping to see continue with the implementation of these strategies. Um, there's a lot more work needed to sort of really, really test and prove the effectiveness of these structures, but, um, but they're not brand new. They're, not, they're, they're used in a lot of other places and a lot of other parts of the Southwest in particular. Um, and they just can, can be really effective in both raising the water table recharging shallow aquifers, improving riparian conditions. Um, and then from a private lands perspective, uh, you know, anything that provides, that keeps more water in the landscape, that can grow more vegetation, keeps more water on the land, you know, improves the, probably the, the value of that property is um, of benefit to ranchers. Now ultimately, we hope that Jeff doesn't have to be the, busy, the only busy beaver or one of the few busy beavers out there on the landscape. The ultimate goal is to see more actual beaver on the landscape that are really performing these and other kinds of functions um, in terms of improving that sponge effect of watersheds. And, um, you know, we're even contemplating dropping them off into the wilderness using parachutes. This is a joke. No, it's actually not a joke. Actually, this happened in the 1950s in Idaho. I don't know if any of you have seen. This has been like a link that's been passed around recently. There's some really fantastic YouTube video that, that's filmed from the 50s, a sort of promotional film, about their efforts to take nuisance beaver in other parts of the state and fly them up into the wilderness. So while we're not actually doing this with parachutes and beavers, <laughs> we, are, we are working with a lot of the, especially public land agencies, to um, you know, collect some data, do some landscape assessments to try to make some suggestions on what might be some good places to, to consider reintroducing beaver and um, trying to kind of help lay some groundwork to see more beaver actually out there on the landscape performing the great job that they do as, as helping to increase the sponge effect. So uh, the next set of actions are all actions that are being taken by Eric Kalska on his ranch in the Big Hole Valley of, uh, right outside of Glen, Montana. And so Eric is a rancher that I mentioned earlier who I've been sort of sitting down and talking with about climate change. And, you know, Eric is just, um, it's just been such a pleasure for me to work with, in part because I find his just general attitude about thinking about climate change really inspiring. You know, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of people when I talk about, oh, you know, climate change is going to, you know, it's going to be a lot more arid and you're going to have a lot more trouble, you know, having a sustainable ranching operation, you know, that would get a lot of people down. But what Eric's response to that has been, all right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look around and cast a wide net. And he's done his own reading of the primary literature from Africa and Israel to sort of come up with new techniques for dealing with agriculture and arid systems. And he's just, he's going out and implementing and experimenting on his property. Um, he's also a real pleasure um, for me to work with as a wildlife conservationist because he 
Uh, obviously, he has to have a sustainable ranching operation. This is a multi-generational rancher. It's his livelihood. But he does value the wildlife um, values of his property. He has journals that his great-grandmother wrote over 100 years ago, and they talk about grasses hip high and all the wildlife sightings that she would see each year. And so he cares about that. So it's a really, a really cool partnership. Uh, a lot of it is, is him coming up with his own ideas and occasionally using me as a sounding board. Um, but I like talking about the work he's doing because I think it, it's, there's some really interesting and, and at least novel to this area, uh, ideas that are a little bit novel. One of those is about um, using innovative irrigation management where he's trying to um, combine flood and sprinkler irrigation. So uh, in the past, as I'm sure you're all aware, there was a big move to get people to stop flood irrigating and use more efficient sprinklers. And Eric you know, used some of that incentive money to establish a center pivot irrigation on his primary pasture on his property. But he actually really lamented the lot, some of the losses that came when he switched from flood to sprinkler. Um, he used to have a whole you know, nice rows of, of shrubs along the edges of his field where the waters would sort of filter down and, and they could support shrub growth that have all disappeared. They provided you know, shelter in the winter for his cattle. Um, and he also appreciated that they um, provided other habitat for riparian species. He also, um, they would also see, you know, waterfowl coming and using these flooded fields. Um, so, so he was kind of disappointed when he switched over for a number of reasons. And one day I pulled him aside at a coffee break, and, and um, my colleague Brad Shepard, who, who some of you know, had been talking with me a lot about, well, you know, we're going to have big floods in the springtime, especially as, you know, in going forward with climate change. We could have bigger pulses in the spring. Wouldn't it be great if we could spread some of that water um, when, the, when the river is bankful, instead of having it be high velocity, shooting down the system, causing erosion, causing damage, spread it across the land more, recharge aquifers, allow for some of that return flow later in the summer when uh, space flows are, are declining. And so I mentioned this to Eric at a coffee break in a meeting. I'd never met the guy before. And he, he was, I said, would you even consider doing this? Like, like logistically, could you? And he was like, I don't know. I'll think about it. I saw him three months later, and he said, oh, you know that flood sprinkler thing? I did it this year. You know, I tried it out. I was like, holy crap, really? So, um, and so he's, he's working mostly in one lower field. It's just off this picture, but he's trying to, find ways to kind of spread some of the water across his field without it interfering with his sort of other irrigation equipment. And, um, you know, he really likes what he's seeing. And so from his perspective, it helps to grow more grass for his cows. It also grows more forage for wild animals. Um, from a, a sort of more ecosystem standpoint and wildlife habitat standpoint, we're hoping it can bring back some of those shrubs that have been lost from the riparian areas. Um, and, and that it, you know, at least functionally can you know, serve to recharge some of those aquifers and have some of that return flow. Now, as it turns out, Eric's property is pretty sandy soil. So this is actually probably not the best place for, for really doing that kind of aquifer storage or you know, re rebuilding shallow aquifer storage and, and return flows because the water returns really within a couple of days. You'd really love it to be a couple of weeks or maybe a month. Um, but, you know, again, he's testing out a lot of the logistics of can you even do it, and it's really valuable for, from our perspective to be able to work with him on that. So some of the other things he's doing, um, actually you can see, any of you can see in this, this pasture right here, see some, some little striations. Um, this has been a pasture that's been kind of like the bane of Eric's existence. He sort of complains about it all the time. It's never, it's been, it's been tilled, it's been seeded, it's never grown a good crop of anything for anybody to eat. Uh, you know, he's trying to grow grass, not, not food. But, um, and what he did is, is a couple years ago went in and put in these contour ridges. So it's a ditch followed by a mound, and you follow along the contour. And what it has served to do is when in the past he would get these rain events, the big sheet flows right off the surface of that pasture, eroding all the topsoil, dumping it into his other fields, um, not sort of soaking in at all for, for um, the plants to use. It now, those sheet flows, kind of pool up in the, in the ditches, they overtop, they get caught in the next ridge over, and so on. And so the, the, he's seeing a lot more um, moisture in the soil. He actually had a couple of, right the first year he put them in, a big flush of grass growth, seeds that were planted maybe five years ago that had never really grown in great abundance before, just had a big flush of growth. And so he's really excited again by what he's seeing. Um, and, and so again, you know, the idea is that you know, as we lose sort of our ability to store water in snowpack, we have more big pulse rain events coming in systems like this. 
that, that maybe some of these kinds of urban structures can help to better maximize sort of the sponge effect of these systems. He's also um, setting up these sort of small rock dams on these dry gullies, where he also occasionally gets gully washes and that otherwise just kind of erode material down into his fields. Now it's really trapping it and, and creating more plant growth in those gullies. So again, just a couple of examples of how, um, how work that we're doing and that other partners we're partnering with are trying to kind of deal with the, the loss of snowpack storage, deal with increasing water um, decline or decreasing water availability, um, and try to still have a sustainable ranching operation while, that can provide wildlife habitat and benefits as well. So, you know, one of the things we've really found from this work is, again, that identifying those actions that can provide multiple benefits have really, I think, greased the wheels for a broader adoption of these practices. We're sort of trying to kind of catalog that and document that a little bit more rigorously right now. But, um, you know, again, there's, there's everywhere from, you know, state water managers to individual landowners to conservation organizations to soil and water conservation districts that are really interested in a lot of these techniques. And I think that that has a lot to do with the fact that they don't just provide benefits to grizzly bears, but in fact provide these multiple benefits and that there's a real advantage to seeing adaptation actions on the ground if we can be working more at that interface. The other point I want to make is that there is definitely a big need to more fully understand the effects of all these different strategies. Um, the, we're doing a lot of work to monitor and, and measure the effectiveness of the beaver mimicry structures, trying to work a lot more with USGS to do, do even more of that. Um, but especially the work on Eric's property, he's very interested in learning more about the effects and what's actually going on. And so I definitely would encourage anybody who's interested in any of this kind of work or these kinds of topics to reach out to me if you're interested in, in maybe trying to do some research uh, related to this work. <clears throat> okay, so I want to kind of wrap up with just a couple of teasers about some other work, again, to plant some seeds in case there's any sort of overlapping areas of interest with any of you here. Um, the first is, and, and these, are, these are explicitly work that are kind of at that interface of thinking about adapt climate change planning for both na natural and human systems. The first is a new working group. We're just getting started on the ecological impacts of drought. Uh, there's a lot of focus on direct impacts of drought on water, surface water supplies and agricultural systems. And we want to sort of better catalog what we know about the impacts of drought, and in particular climate change driven drought on, on e ecosystems and how that may be relevant to natural resource management, but also to human communities as they think about how they prepare for and, and plan for the effects of drought. So this is a collaborative effort funded by USGS and in partnership with USGS, the Nature Conservancy, and WCS, and, and, and the NCS, which is the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara. And again, it'll be kind of a synthesis work where we're trying to synthesize what do we know about ecological drought but also to be engaging with, with some of the end users to better understand, well, what information about ecological drought do you care about or might you want to know more about? So we're, we're definitely thinking about those same kinds of challenges within this project as well. And one of the ways that's, that's kind of a national scale synthesis, but I want to sort of anchor that and to try to help sort of gather some of that information about ecological drought and to use it to help support drought planning that's underway here in the upper Missouri headwaters that's not led by us, but is part of this National Drought Resilience Partnership, which is a bunch of different federal agencies that do work on drought. Um, and then they have a, a local pilot here in Montana that involves the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation and the local EPA office. So there's a lot of drought planning underway among the, the different watersheds in the upper Missouri headwaters. And so I'm, I'm trying to sort of try to help support that, help them think about the ecological effects, help them think about climate change when they do that drought planning. So with that, I'll just close with just a couple of quick points that, that again, I, don't, I know not everybody here is maybe involved in the Montana Climate Assessment, but I've been you know, working some with Kathy and, and others to, to talk about it and, and plan it. And um, so I just thought I'd share just a couple of points from the work I've done that I think could be helpful. Um, as, as I've talked about with Kathy before, I do think adaptation planning can be an effective way to learn more about end user information needs. It can be really hard to sort of start the conversation with managers just sort of cold turkey and say, well, what kind of information do you need? You know, often that conversation goes, well, well what kind of information do you have? And it's like, oh, I've got tons of information. What do you need? <laughs> it's like, well, I don't really know. You know, and, and that's not true for everybody at all. It's not true for every manager. 
but most people haven't had the opportunity to really think about what it means. So I do think this kind of planning can be helpful. I was going to throw out there that it might be worth thinking about some of these conceptual models and whether that can help. You know, when I read chapters like, okay, here's sort of the impacts um, facing, you know, say, water, the water sector in Montana, and, you know, there'll be something about snowpack change, there'll be something about forest change, something about, um, you know, groundwater, something about surface water. And, you know, I, it may be helpful to sort of think about whether some conceptual models could help tie those pieces together. Um, I think it would be great if the assessment could include some of these case studies um, that are out there about how people are really using detailed climate data to inform decisions. There's a ton of examples on the native trout front, um, other kinds of examples as well. And I think that just helps to seed ideas as people are, who are newer to this thinking can kind of see, oh, well, that's how some other people are doing it. Oh, that would probably be relevant for me too. Um, and I also think that you know, the Institute on Ecosystems in general, and I think through the climate assessment um, specifically, can be a real you know, um, a mechanism for enabling that networking between scientists and managers. I would actually call it matchmaking. I have this idea of doing one of these like speed dating kind of events where you have scientists and managers or conservationists and you, you know, sort of move around and meet people so you know like, okay, I'm interested in bighorn sheep disease issues. Okay, I can go call Molly's husband Paul and I know I now I've met him, I know to call him and um, maybe that's not the way to do it but um, I think that there's some real value in helping to match people up that way um, and to match practitioners up. So through these kinds of case studies, through information sharing, um, by, by learning by what, from what others are doing. I think you can really create a more informed populace and community of practitioners as well. And I think, you know, the IOE, I, I think, is a, it's a good fit for thinking about, I think, what, what the IOE wants to do and in general, and, and I think could use the Montana Climate Assessment as a way to start some of that on climate change specifically. So with that, um, I'll be happy to take any questions, um, you know, about either global conservation work at WCS, as my daughter Willa is very intently studying. <laughs> In the next photo I have of this, she's actually like eating it, <laughs> which I figured was a more appropriate use of that newsletter for her. But, <laughs> um, but thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. If there I uh, was interested in like your water spreading thing, so yeah. there's a whole literature on that mm -hmm. that, that could be rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. And then if you start thinking of doing some of those things practically, would you think of, I'm pretty sure that there are people who would come to Montana and pay for the job to uh, go to selected places and install your beaver dams and uh, your rock dams, you know, that, that's a service that's like better than beaver. <laughs> we, we've actually, one of the ways that we've tried to spread the word about, about those projects is to host, host work days. So usually it is about getting people to come out and, and build them with their own two hands. And it, and it is, it's a great testimonial in terms of like, oh, this isn't so hard. And, and it's, I mean, that's one of the things that's also probably that's really um, greased the wheels for its uptake is the sort of low cost low-tech aspect of some of that work. And, and there's a lot of people working on beaver mimicry structures, and they do span quite a spectrum from cost and sort of technological know-how that's required to implement them. But, um, but they, they, they can offer some pretty low-cost, low-tech strategies, and we do a lot of work days. And they've been, I, I think, really effective in getting people excited about them and hadn't thought about from a more uh, outside adventure <laughs> enjoyment type perspective of getting people out there to build them, but it's a great idea. Thanks. How do you um, measure success in one of these projects? Have you changed people's attitudes? Good question. Do That's a really good question. Of people's appreciation of climate change threats? So we don't, I would say, I say we know we don't really have that baseline. Um, we, we certainly have tried to um, you know, do some, after our workshops, do sort of evaluation, ask people to fill out evaluations that include some questions of, you know, and, you know, various forms of in what ways or how did this, or did this workshop increase your understanding of climate impacts, increase your understanding of what kinds of actions or strategies you might consider taking. So we do try to take the pulse there. That's been mostly kind of immediately after our workshop. We haven't done a lot and would like to do more sort of follow-up, maybe more like a year or two after, to really get a sense for whether people's thinking is changing. 
Um, you know, that's, that's definitely a really hard part for me, and it's something that I would love to um, work with others on because it is more about a change in mindset more so than a change in practice on the ground per se. In some cases, actions might change on the ground, but not always. Sometimes it's just they're thinking about the work a little differently, and that's really hard to measure. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of it's been more anecdotally. So I held the very first adaptation planning workshop I held was with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at a time when they were on an upswing of being willing to think about climate change. And it was sort of all of their fisheries managers were there in a room. Wyatt, I think, was there at that meeting, perhaps. Um, and, you know, it was a really great workshop. And, and, and I thought it was very successful, but, you know, I didn't really know for sure. And then I got a call like two months later from a Forest Service guy who wasn't at the workshop. And he's like, I heard you did this workshop with Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Like, what did you talk about there? Of course, I like, have no idea where he's coming from or what he's getting at. And I was like, oh, we talked about this and that. And he was like, wow, because it's amazing. Because you know, the interactions that I have with those FWP managers is totally different after your meeting. You know, they're, they had been all fixated on the main stem and, and really only focused on the main stem. And now they're willing to talk about the high elevation tributaries. And, you know, so a lot of times it's anecdotal information like that, too, um, which, again, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of go out and dig that up, but it does come my way sometimes. But, um, but yeah, I'd love to have any other ideas on thinking about how to capture some of that. About a week ago, on uh, NPR in the morning, I've forgotten the gentleman's name that they always interview, the sort of social scientist. No, he has some interesting twists yeah. on things. And the last one he had was on expertise. And um, providing, uh, when you have experts come uh, to yeah. a workshop and you dub them as experts, yeah. um, that they tend to be more expert than they should be. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think we've all experienced that in yeah. our workshops. I wonder how you sorted some of that out with the great amount of uncertainty that the civil war is about. Yeah. Um, I would say that, that in most of the workshops, especially that sort of first generation of workshops to date, um, we haven't sorted that out real explicitly. And I think that it, it, it very well could be a concern. But, but one, so, so I'll say, um, okay, so I would say we haven't dealt with it very much in our workshop settings to date. One other thing I was thinking about including on that list of things to think about with the climate assessment might be as we have more and more of these adaptation planning efforts, and it's not just me who's doing this, there's the the um, Northern Rockies Adaptation Partnership, a Forest Service-led effort that did a bunch of adaptation planning last fall. Um, there's other more localized efforts in the Crown or in the Greater Yellowstone. It might be really useful to go back to some of those reports and look at some of the statements that are made and then see whether the synthesis, the more sort of structured and formal synthesis of published information and data supports or corroborates or disagrees with any of those statements. Um, you know, part of that iterative process to kind of have some check and go back um, so, you know, I, whether that's as part of the climate assessment or I think it could be a value of the climate assessment and how somebody like myself might use it um, to, to look back at some of the planning that has been done in that more informal way. Um, I did try to deal with it a little bit when I was doing, dabbling in a little bit of more for, sort of formal expert elicitation where um, I did it using surveys where I sent surveys to individual um, grizzly bear experts in this case on grizzly bear connectivity and climate change. And I very explicitly said, like, I'm not asking you to comment on the likelihood of increased aridity. Like, I'm asking you to comment on if that does happen, you know, what's the impact of bears? And so I tried to kind of parse out, like, I'm targeting you because you're a grizzly bear biologist, and I want you to answer this question specifically. And actually, on those surveys, you, I could tell people were answering different questions than I was asking, um, which is part of the, the art of surveys, but, but also just uh, uh, variability in how people read surveys. So, um, you know, that I think kind of more formal expo expert elicitation kinds of processes can probably deal with that a little bit better. But it still involves saying, well, I mean, I've pigeonholed this person as only a grizzly bear biologist, and that may or may not be actually, maybe it's over, over pigeon, you know, pigeonholing them, pigeoning them into too small of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> As a sort of facilitator, kind of, you can play a role in drawing yeah, people out more. If you convince somebody else 
that he will also come forward in that way. I, hmm. that, you're suggesting, I think, a nice way to do what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.